Welcome to Understanding Chapter One of Mastering Bitcoin by Andreas Antonopoulos. Um, this is part of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. Um, so Mastering Bitcoin by Andreas Antonopoulos is probably the best Bitcoin textbook in existence. Uh, second edition has been out since 2017. The book is solid from a content and technical perspective. There are programming examples in the book, but you don't need to be a programmer to understand the book's content. And the book has a supporting GitHub site where the materials are available under a Creative Commons license. Um, this video and the book are both, and the book on the GitHub site are both uh, covered by this Creative Commons license. So with that, let's dive into chapter one. Okay, so chapter one is a high level introduction to Bitcoin. Um, the author Andreas starts out by saying, what is Bitcoin? And he describes Bitcoin as a collection of concepts and technologies that forms the basis of a digital money ecosystem. Units of currency called Bitcoin are used to store and transmit value among participants in the Bitcoin network. Bitcoin users communicate with each other using the Bitcoin protocol via the internet, although other transport networks can also be used. The Bitcoin protocol stack is available as open source software and can be run on a wide range of computing devices, including laptops and smartphones, making the technology accessible to users. Users can transfer Bitcoin over the network to do just about anything that can do be done with conventional currencies, including buying and selling goods, sending money to people or organizations, or extending credit. Bitcoin can be purchased, sold, and exchanged for other currencies at specialized currency exchanges. Bitcoin, in a sense, is a perfect form of money for the internet because it is fast, secure, and borderless. Unlike traditional currencies, Bitcoin is entirely virtual. There are no physical coins or even digital coins per se. Coins are implied in transactions that transfer value from sender to recipient. Users of Bitcoin own keys that allow them to prove ownership of Bitcoin in the Bitcoin network. With these keys, they can sign transactions to unlock the value and spend it by transferring it to a new money new owner. Keys are often stored in a digital wallet on each user's computer or smartphone. Possession of the key that can sign a transaction is the prerequisite to spending Bitcoin, putting the control in the hands of the user. So let's stop here and think about what we just read. Um, so basically what the author is saying is that Bitcoin is essentially cash. It's not really like a credit card um, where you're using a bank. This is actually digital internet cash that you can spend just like you could spend a dollar um and that it's entirely virtual and how you know whether or not you control it is through these keys that are stored in a digital wallet and so let's keep on going through this uh bitcoin is a distributed peer-to-peer -peer system as such there's no central server or point of control bitcoins i.e units of bitcoin are created through a process called mining which involves competing and defining solutions to a mathematical problem while processing bitcoin transactions any participant in the Bitcoin network, i.e. anyone using a device running the full Bitcoin protocol stack, may operate as a miner, using their computer's processing power to verify and record transactions. Every 10 minutes, on average, a Bitcoin miner can validate the transactions of the past 10 minutes and is rewarded with brand new Bitcoins. Essentially, Bitcoin mining decentralizes the currency issuance and clearing functions of a central bank and replaces the need for any central bank. So you, there's no need for a Federal Reserve, um, according to the author. Uh, the Bitcoin protocol includes built-in algorithms that regulate the mining function across the network. The difficulty of the processing tasks that miners must perform is adjusted dynamically so that on average, someone succeeds every 10 minutes, regardless of how many miners and how much processing are competing at any moment. The protocol also halves the rate at which new Bitcoin is created every four years and limits the total number of Bitcoin that created to a fixed total just below 21 million coins. The result is that the number of Bitcoin in circulation closely follows an easily predictable curve that approaches 21 million by the year 2140. Due to Bitcoin's diminishing rate of issuance over the long term, the Bitcoin currency is deflationary. Furthermore, Bitcoin cannot be inflated by printing new money above and beyond the expected issuance rate. Behind the scenes, Bitcoin is also the name of the protocol, a peer-to-peer -peer network, and a distributed computing innovation. So the Bitcoin currency is really only the first application of this invention. 
Bitcoin represents the culmination of decades of research in cryptography and distribu distributed systems and includes four key innovations brought together in a unique and powerful combination. Bitcoin consists of a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network, i.e. the Bitcoin protocol. It's a public transaction ledger referred to as a blockchain. It's a set of rules for independent transaction validation and concurrency issuance, uh, sometimes referred to as decentralized consensus rules. And it's a mechanism for reaching global decentralized consensus on the valid blockchain um, using the mining techniques referred to as proof of work algorithm. As a software developer, the author sees Bitcoin as similar to the Internet of Money, a network for propagating value and securing the ownership of digital assets via distributed computation. Um, and says there's a lot more to Bitcoin than first meets the eye. In this chapter, We'll start by explaining some of the main concepts and terms, obtaining the necessary software, and using Bitcoin for some simple example transactions. In the following chapters, we'll start in wrapping the layers of technology that make Bitcoin possible and examine the inner workings of the Bitcoin network and protocol. The next section describes uh, so the attempts at digital currencies before Bitcoin. So the emergence of viable digital money is, is linked to developments in cryptography. It's not surprising when one considers the fundamental challenges involved with using bits to represent value that can be exchanged for goods and services. Uh, three basic questions for anyone accepting digital money are, can I trust that the money is authentic and not counterfeit? Can I trust that the digital money can only be spent once, which is known as a double spend problem where you, know, you wanna make sure there's no counterfeiting. And can I be sure that no one else can claim this money? You know, it belongs to them and not me. Uh, issuers of paper money are constantly battling the counterfeiting problem by using so increasingly sophisticated paper and printing technology. Physical money like dollars addresses a double spend issue because the same paper note can only be spent in one place. Uh, of course, conventional money is, often is also often stored and transmitted digitally. In those cases, the counterfeiting and double spend, issue, double spend issues are handed by clearing electronic transactions through central authorities that have a global view of the currency in circulation. For digital money, which cannot take advantage of esoteric inks or holographic strips, cryptography provides the basis for trusting the legitimacy of a user's claim to value. Specifically, cryptographic digital signatures enable a user to sign a digital asset or transaction, proving the ownership of that asset. With the appropriate architecture, digital signatures can also be used to address the double spending issue. When cryptography started becoming more broadly available and understood in the late 1980s, many researchers began trying to use cryptography to build digital currencies. These early digital currency projects issued digital money, usually backed by a national currency or a precious metal, such as gold. Although these early digital currencies worked, they were centralized and as a result were easy to attack by government and hackers. Early digital signatures used a central currency house to settle all transactions at regular intervals just like a traditional banking system. Unfortunately, in most cases, these early digital currencies were targeted by worried governments and eventually litigated out of existence. Some early currencies failed in spectacular crashes when the parent company went into bankruptcy uh, to be robust against intervention by antagonists, whether legitimate governments or criminal elements, a decentralized digital currency is needed to avoid a single point of attack. Bitcoin is such a system, decentralized by design, and free of any central authority or point of control that can be attacked or corrupted. Although that last statement is somewhat arguable as to whether or not it's free of points that can be attacked or corrupted. Um, and we'll talk about that in more detail later. Under the history of Bitcoin, uh, let's, that's what chapter one goes into next. Uh, Bitcoin was in, was, publicized in 2008 with the publication of a paper titled uh, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system written by Satoshi Nakamoto, um, which is a pseudonym. We don't really know who Satoshi is. Uh, Nakamoto combined several prior inventions such as B-Money and Hashcash to create a completely decentralized electronic cash system that does not rely on a central authority for currency issuance or settlement and validation of transactions. Satoshi's key innovation was to use a distributed computation system, which is called a proof of work algorithm, to conduct essentially a global election every 10 minutes, allowing the decentralized network to arrive at consensus about the current state of transactions. This elegantly solves the issue of double spending 
where a single currency unit can be spent twice. Previously, the double spending problem was a weakness of digital currencies and was addressed by, was addressed by clearing all transactions through a central clearinghouse. Uh, the Bitcoin network was launched early in 2009 based on a reference implementation published by Nakamoto and since revised by other programmers. The implementation of the proof of work algorithm, which we refer to as mining, provides security and resilience for Bitcoin, and that has increased in power exponentially as the value of Bitcoin has increased. Um, and currently, the combined, you know, there's a massive amount of processing power dedicated to Bitcoin. Uh, it may, in fact, be the single most processing intensive software application being used today in the world. Bitcoin's total market value has at times exceeded trillions of dollars, depending on the Bitcoin to dollar exchange rate. The largest transaction process so far by the network was a uh, billion dollars. And at the time that was processed, it was processed for a fee of only 0.68. Now note this book was written in 2017, so there may well have been some transactions since then. Uh, and certainly Bitcoin fees are quite a bit more than 60 cents today. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto withdrew from the public in April 2011, uh, leaving the responsibility of developing the code network to a thriving group of volunteers, which may very well have included um, the people behind Satoshi Nakamoto in their in their in, an, in their other identity. Uh, the identity of the person or people behind Bitcoin is still unknown. However, neither Satoshi Nakamoto nor anyone else uh, exerts individual control over the Bitcoin system which operates based on fully transparent mathematical principles, open source code and consensus among participants. Um, this system is a groundbreaking invention has already spawned new science in the fields of distributed computing, economics and econo econometrics. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's invention is also a practical and novel solution to a problem of distributed computing known as the Byzantine generals problem. Briefly, the problem consists of trying to agree on a course of action or the state of a system by exchanging information over an unreliable and potentially compromised network. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's solution, which uses a concept of proof of work to achieve consensus without a central trusted authority, represents a breakthrough in distributed computing and has wide applicability beyond currency. It can be used to achieve consensus on decentralized networks to prove the fairness of elections, lotteries, asset reg registries, digital notarization, and more. And there's been a lot of research on decentralized consensus uh, trying to extend and come up with alternatives to Satoshi's solutions since uh, the paper was released back in 2008. Uh, this textbook uses a number of example Bitcoin users uh, in, in its examples. And so next, what the textbook does is it goes through several of these users and what they're trying to use this electronic cash Bitcoin to do. So let's walk, talk about some of these uh, users here. Now, if you think about it, Bitcoin is an innovation in the technology of money. And at its core, money is for the exchange of value between people. And so in order to fully understand Bitcoin and how you can use it, uh, the textbook is going to use the perspectives of several different people and how they're going to use this cryptocurrency. Um, the first uh, person is going to be using it for North America uh, for low value retail purchases. And so the user is Ellis. You know, Ellis is a, a very common name in uh, security and cryptography circles. Uh, Ellis lives in the Bay Area in California. She's heard about Bitcoin from her techie friends and wants to start using it. Uh, and so her story is all about, you know, introduction to Bitcoin, how to acquire some and how to spend some to buy a cup of coffee at Bob's Cafe in Palo Alto outside of Stanford. Uh, this story is going to introduce us to this software, how to obtain cryptocurrency from an exchange and basic transactions from, from the perspective of a retail consumer. Carol is a art gallery owner and she's gonna be a high value retailer. Uh, she's gonna sell expensive paintings for Bitcoin. Uh, and so, so this will, story is gonna introduce us to the risks of various attacks for retail, uh, on Bitcoin from the perspective of a retailer of a high value item. Um, Bob, the cafe owner in Palo Alto uh, is building a new website. He is contracted with an Indian web developer who lives in Indy, Bangalore. Uh, and the developer, Gopesh, has agreed to be paid in Bitcoin. So this story will examine the use of Bitcoin for outsourcing contract services and international wire transfers. Um, Gabriel is an enterprising young teenager in Rio de Janeiro. 
He's running a small web store and sells Bitcoin branded T-shirts, coffee mugs, and stickers. He's too young to have a big bank account. Um, so he's using Bitcoin instead of a bank account. Um, we'll also take a look at it from a charitable donation perspective. Eugenia is the director of a children's charity in the Philippines. She's discovered Bitcoin and wants to use it to reach a whole new group of foreign and domestic donors to fundraise for a charity. Uh, she's also investigating ways to use Bitcoin to distribute funds quickly to areas of need. So this will talk about Bitcoin from a perspective of fundraising and as an open ledger for transparency in charitable organizations. Um, our next example is Mohammed. He's an electronics importer in Dubai. He's trying to use Bitcoin to buy electronics from the US and China to import into the UAE to accelerate the process of payments for imports. So we'll show how Bitcoin can be used in large B2B international payments. And then finally, mining for Bitcoin. Uh, Jing is a computer engineering student in Shanghai. He's got a mining rig to mine Bitcoin uh, to supplement his income. And this will talk about how uh, you know, the specialized equipment that can be used to uh, mine Bitcoin for cryptocurrency. So each of these stories is based on real people and real industries that are currently using Bitcoin to create new markets, new industries, and new solutions to global economic issues. All right, so those are the user examples we're gonna be using throughout this book. Uh, so the next section is just a brief introduction to getting started with Bitcoin. Uh, so let's talk about how we get started as a user. So Bitcoin is a protocol that can be accessed using a client application that understands the protocol. A Bitcoin wallet is the most common user interface to the Bitcoin system, just like a web browser is the most common user interface for the HTTP protocol. There are many implementations and brands of Bitcoin wallets, just as there are many brands of web browsers, you know, Chrome, Safari, Microsoft Edge, Firefox, and so on. And just like we all have our favorite web browsers like Firefox and our least favorite, maybe Internet Explorer, uh, Bitcoin wallets vary in quality, performance, security, privacy, and reliability. And there's also a reference implementation of the Bitcoin protocol that includes a wallet known as Bitcoin Core, uh, which is derived from the original implementation written by Satoshi Nakamoto. So Bitcoin wallets are one of the most actively developed applications in the Bitcoin ecosystem. There's intense competi competition because everybody wants to come up with the killer app the great user interface that's gonna attract lots of users. And so why new wallets are being developed all the time uh, and several wallets from last year have already gone out of business, many wallets focus on specific platforms or specific uses, and some wallets are more suitable for beginners while others are filled with features for advanced users. Choosing a wallet is highly subjective and depends on the use and the user expertise. So, you know, we really shouldn't recommend a specific brand or wallet. However, you can categorize wallets according to their platform and function and provide some clarity about all the different types of wallets that exist. Um, now, one of the good things about wallets is that it's relatively easy to move, to have your wallets uh, and move cryptocurrency from one wallet to another. Basically, the way you do that is by moving the keys that unlock the cryptocurrency from one wallet to another. And so it's worth trying out several different wallets as a user until you find a wallet that fits your specific needs. Um, Bitcoin wallets can be categorized according to the platform. Now, this part of the textbook is somewhat out of date, uh, but the general principles are still okay. Um, you know, obviously this was written in 2017, this is now 2021. There are additional wallets on the market today that didn't exist back then. But let's look at these categories. These categories are pretty much the categories that were around back then. So the first category is desktop wallets. Then we got mobile wallets, web wallets, which means web browser wallets, hardware wallets, uh, which are the USB devices, and then paper wallets, which are a piece of paper. So let's read through the details of each one of these. So a desktop wallet was the first type of Bitcoin wallet, uh, which was cr created as a reference implementation with Bitcoin Core. Uh, and many users run desktop wallets for the features, autonomy, and control they offer. Uh, running on general use operating systems such as Windows and Mac OS has certain security disadvantages. However, as those platforms may very well be insecure or poorly configured. Mobile wallets are the most common type of Bitcoin wallet. Running on a smartphone operating system such as Apple iOS and Android, these wallets are often a great choice for new users. Many are designed for simplicity and easy use. Oh, but there are also full featured mobile wallets for power users. Web wallets are accessed through a web browser and store the user's wallet on a server owned by a third party. 
This is similar to web mail and then it relies entirely on a third party server. Some of these services operate using client side code running the user's browser, which keeps control of the Bitcoin keys in the hands of the user. Most, however, present a compromise by taking control of the Bitcoin keys from users in exchange for free ease of use. Um, it's inadvisable to store large amounts of Bitcoin on third party systems. We'll talk about this later, but basically, um, you know, it's a question of control. Who do you want to give control over your currency? Uh, hardware wallets are devices that operate as a secure, self-contained Bitcoin wallet on special purpose hardware. They usually connect to a desktop or a mobile device by a USB cable or near field communication and are operated with a web browser or company and software. By handling all Bitcoin related operations on the specialized hardware, these wallets are considered very secure and suitable for storing large amounts of Bitcoin. Um, now these different categories here, these are probably the most secure. The last one is paper wallets. The keys controlling Bitcoin can also be printed for long-term storage. These are known as paper wallets, even though other materials like wood, metal, and so on can be used. Paper wallets offer a low-tech but a highly secure means of storing Bitcoin long-term. Offline storage is often often referred to as cold storage. Another way to categorize Bitcoin wallets is by their degree of autonomy and how they interact with the Bitcoin network. Um, we're going to go into this categorization in much more detail later on. But basically, the three categories we're looking at here are full node clients, lightweight clients, and third party API clients. A full node client is a client that stores the entire history of Bitcoin transactions, every transaction by every user ever, and, man and manages the user's wallet and can initiate transactions directly on the Bitcoin network. A full node handles all aspects of the Bitcoin protocol and can independently validate any transaction in the entire blockchain. A full node client substan consumes substantial computer resources, uh, more than 125 gigs of disk, more than two gigs of RAM, but offers complete autonomy and independent transaction verification. A lightweight client, also known as a simplified payment verification or SPV client, connects to Bitcoin full nodes for access to the Bitcoin transaction information, but stores the user wallet locally and independently creates, validates, and transmits transactions. Lightweight clients interact directly with the Bitcoin network without an intermediary. So most wallets actually fall into this category of the lightweight client. A third party API client is one that interacts with Bitcoin through a third party system of APIs, application programming interfaces, rather than by connecting to the Bitcoin wallet directly. The wallet may be stored by the user or by third party servers, but all transactions go through a third party. So for example, if you're using Coinbase, you're probably using a third party API client. Combining these categorizations, many Bitcoin wallets fall into several different groups, with the three most common being like a desktop full client, a mobile lightweight wallet, and a web third party wallet. The lines between the different categories are often blurry, as many wallets run on multiple platforms and can interact with the network in different ways. For the purpose of this book, uh, we're gonna demonstrate the use of a variety of downloadable Bitcoin clients from the reference implementation, which is uh, Bitcoin Core to mobile and web wallets. Some of the examples require the use of Bitcoin Core, which in addition to being a full client, also exposes APIs to the wallet, network and transaction services. Uh, if you're planning to explore the programmatic interfaces in the Bitcoin system, you will need to run Bitcoin Core, or one of the alternative clients. Uh, when I go through the later uh, chapters in this textbook, I will actually download Bitcoin Core and run through those examples using Bitcoin Core. Um, so Alice, who we introduced in Bitcoin users and their stories, is not a technical user and only recently heard about Bitcoin from her friend, Joe. While at a party, Joe is once again enthusiastically explaining Bitcoin to all around him and is offering a demonstration. Intrigued, Alice asks how she can get started with Bitcoin. Joe says that a mobile wallet is best for new users and Joe recommends a few of his favorite wallets. Alice downloads Blue Wallet for Android and installs it on her phone. When Alice runs Blue Wallet for the first time, she chooses the option to create a new Bitcoin wallet and takes a moment away from Joe and all other parties to write down a secret phrase in order on a piece of paper. As explained by the mobile wallet and by Joe earlier, the monomic phrase allows Alice to restore her wallet in case she loses her mobile device and grants her access to her funds on another device. After creating her wallet and having her uh, backup monomic phase, um, you know, securely hidden, Alice can tap on her wallet to see her Bitcoin amount, her transaction history, as well as two buttons that allow her to either receive or send Bitcoin. Uh, 
So a modern Bitcoin wallet will provide a monomic phrase, sometimes referred to as a seed or seed phrase, for Alice to back up her Bitcoin wallet. The monomic phrase consists of 12 to 24 English words selected randomly by the software and used as a basis for the key, the cryptographic keys that are generated by the wallet to secure the cryptocurrency. The monomic phrase can be used by Alice to restore all the transactions and funds in her wallet in case of an event such as she loses her mobile device or there's a software bug or her memory gets erased or whatever. So Alice needs to be careful to store the monomic phrase in a way that balances the need to prevent theft and accidental loss. If, she, you know, if her monomic phrase is stolen, then whoever steals it could potentially steal all of her cryptocurrency. If she protects it too much, though, her monomic will be at risk of being permanently lost. The recommended way to properly balance these risks is to write two copies of the monomic phrase on paper with each of the words numbered as the order matters. Once Alice has recorded a monomic phrase, she should plan to store each copy in a separate secure location, such as a locked desk drawer, a fireproof safe, a, secret, a safety deposit box, and so on. Um, a couple things to think in keep in mind, you should not attempt to do it yourself security scheme that deviates from best practices. Uh, don't cut your monomic in half, make screenshots, don't store it on USB drives or an email or cloud drives or any other non-standard method. Uh, you will tip the balance in such a way as to risk permanent loss or theft. Many people have lost theft, funds not from theft, but because they tried a non-standard solution without having the security expertise to balance the risks involved. The best practice recommendation was carefully balanced by experts and is suitable for the vast majority of users. Uh, so here's an example diagram of blue wallet. Right now, Alice doesn't have any cryptocurrency in it. She just has a, a wallet and shows that, you know, she could receive and send currency. She could buy some and, you know, and then increase her balance. The main wallet view displays the Bitcoin amount, the transaction history, and the receive and send buttons. And she hasn't done any transactions yet. There's nothing in that display. In addition, many wallets feature the ability to purchase Bitcoin directly through an exchange or a similar service where you can offer fiat money in return for cryptocurrency, which is done by finding the current price of Bitcoin and selling it to the wallet user at or above that price. The buy Bitcoin belt button would allow Alice to purchase Bitcoin in that fashion. Alice is now ready to start using her new Bitcoin wallet. Her wallet application randomly generated a private key, which we're gonna talk about later on in the textbook when we talk about private keys, uh, which is gonna be used to derive Bitcoin addresses that will point to her wallet. At this point, her Bitcoin addresses are not known to the Bitcoin network or registered with any part of the Bitcoin system. There are simply random numbers that correspond to the private key that she has that can be used to control access to the funds. The addresses are generated independently by her wallet without reference or registration with any service. In fact, in most wallets, there is no association between a Bitcoin address and any externally identifiable information, including the user's identity. Until the moment an address is referenced as a recipient of value in a transaction posted on the Bitcoin ledger, the address is simply part of a vast number of possible addresses that are valid in Bitcoin. Only once an address has been associated with a transaction does it become a known address in the network. So if Alice clicks on the receive button, it will display a QR code along with a Bitcoin address. The QR code is the square of a pattern of black and white dots, which serves as a form of barcode that contains the same information in a format that can be scanned by Joe's smartphone camera. In most wallets, tapping the QR code will also magnify it so it can be more easily scanned. Next to the wallet's QR code is a Bitcoin address and codes, and Alice may choose to manually send her address to Joe by copying it onto her clipboard with a tap. Of note, when receiving funds to a new mobile wallet for the first time, Many wallets will often re-verify that you have indeed secured your monomic phrase. This can range from a simple prompt to requiring the user to manually re-enter the phrase. Bitcoin addresses typically start with a 1-3 or a BC1. Like most email addresses, they can be shared with other Bitcoin users who can use them to send Bitcoin directly to your wallet. There is nothing sensitive from a security perspective about the Bitcoin address. It can be posted anywhere without risking the security of the account. Unlike email addresses, you can create new addresses as often as you like, all of which will direct funds to your wallet. In fact, many modern wallets automatically create a new address for every transaction to maximize your privacy. 
A wallet is simply a collection of addresses and the keys that unlock the funds. Alice is now ready to receive funds. Her wallet application randomly generated a private key together with its corresponding Bitcoin address. At this point, her Bitcoin address is not known to the Bitcoin network or registered with any part of the Bitcoin system. Her Bitcoin address is simply a number that corresponds to a key that she can use to add control access to funds. It was generated independently by her wallet without reference or registration of any service. In fact, in most wallets, there is no association between the Bitcoin address and the externally identifiable information. In, until the moment the address is referenced as a recipient of value, Bitcoin address is simply part of a vast number of potential addresses. Only once it's been associated with transaction does it become part of the network. There are several ways that Alice can acquire Bitcoin. She can exchange some of her natural currency like dollars at a cryptocurrency exchange to obtain Bitcoin. She can buy some Bitcoin from a friend or an acquaintance from a Bitcoin meet meetup in exchange for cash. She can find a Bitcoin ATM in her area, which acts as a vending machine selling Bitcoin for cash. She can offer her skills or products she sells and accepts payment in Bitcoin. She can ask her employer or clients to pay her in Bitcoin. All of these methods have varying degrees of difficulty and many will involve paying a fee. Some financial institutions will also require Alice to provide identification documents to comply with local banking regulations and anti-money laundering, uh, AML practices, a process which is known as Know Your Customer, KYC. However, with we'll all these methods, Alice will be able to receive Bitcoin. One of the advantages of Bitcoin over other payment systems is that when you use it correctly, it, it can potentially afford users more privacy than traditional systems. Acquiring, holding, and spending Bitcoin does not require you to divulge sensitive PII information to third parties. However, where Bitcoin touches traditional systems such as currency exchanges, national and international regulations often apply. In order to exchange Bitcoin for your national currency, you will be often be required to provide proof of identity and banking information. Users should be aware that once a Bitcoin address is attached to an identity, all associated Bitcoin transactions are also easy to identify and track. And we'll talk about this later in the textbook. This is one reason many users choose to maintain dedicated exchange accounts unlinked to their wallets. Alice was introduced to Bitcoin by a friend, so she has an easy way to acquire her first Bitcoin. Next, we'll look at how she buys Bitcoin from her friend Joe and how Joe sends the Bitcoin to her wallet. Uh, before Alice can buy Bitcoin from Joe, they have to agree on the exchange rate between Bitcoin and US dollars. This brings up a common question for those new to Bitcoin, who sets the Bitcoin price? Short answer is that the price is set by markets. Bitcoin, like most of their currencies, has a floating exchange rate. This means that the value of Bitcoin uh, compared to any other currency fluctuates according to supply and demand in the various markets where it's traded. For example, the price of Bitcoin in US dollars is calculated in each market based on their most recent trade of Bitcoin in US dollars. As such, the price tends to fluctuate. A pricing service will aggregate the prices from several markets and calculate a volume weighted average representing the broad market exchange rate of a currency pair, uh, you know, trading Bitcoins for dollars. There are hundreds of applications and websites that provide the current market rate. Uh, here's several, Bitcoin average, coin cap, uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and so on. In addition to these various sites and applications, most Bitcoin wallets will automatically convert amounts between Bitcoin and other currencies. Uh, and so Joe can use his wallet to convert the price automatically before sending Bitcoin to Alice. So Alice has decided to exchange $10, $10 worth of US dollars for Bitcoin because she doesn't want to risk too much money on this new technology. So she gives Joe $10 in cash, opens her blue wallet, mobile wallet application, selects receive. This displays a QR code for Alice's first Bitcoin address. Joe then selects send on his blue wallet smartphone and is presented with a screen containing the following inputs. The amount to send in Bitcoin or local currency, destination Bitcoin address, transaction note, and a transaction fee. In the input field for the Bitcoin address, there's a small scan button. This allows Joe to scan the QR code with his smartphone camera so he doesn't have to type in Alice's Bitcoin address, which you know addresses tend to be long and difficult to type. Uh, so Joe taps the scan button, it activates the smartphone camera, scanning the QR code displayed on Alice's smartphone. Joe now has Alice's Bitcoin address set as the recipient. Joe enters the amount as 10 US dollars and his wallet converts it by accessing the most recent exchange rate from an online service. The exchange rate at this time is 100 US dollars for Bitcoin. So 10 uh, US dollars is worth 0.10 Bitcoin or 100 millibit coin. 
as shown in a screenshot from Joe's wallet. In the transaction note description input, Joe enters Ellis. He can use this field to add some information regarding his transaction for future reference. It's for his record keeping only. It's gonna be stored in his wallet and it won't be put on the blockchain or sent to Ellis. He also selects a transaction fee for his transaction. The higher the transaction fee, the faster his transaction will be uh, confirmed on the blockchain. He selects the minimum transaction fee possible at that time. The price of Bitcoin has changed a lot over time um, and an incredible amount since the first edition of this book was written. Uh, you know, as of 2021, uh, a person would need $54,000 to purchase one whole Bitcoin. Many examples in the book reference real life past transactions when the price of Bitcoin was much lower and transactions with zero fees are still possible. Um, so here, for example, uh, Joe is sending 0.1 BTC at a price for $10. And obviously under today's values, that would be like 5,000. Uh, and here's the address that Joe is sending it to. Alice is who he's sending it to. In this case, there's a fee is zero, but currently obviously a much larger fee. And then there's next. Joe then carefully checks to make sure he's entered the correct amount because he's about to transmit money and mistakes are irreversible. Uh, one thing you can do, by the way, is if you're going to send a lot of money, do one transaction for a small amount of money, verify that, that transaction goes through, and then do the second transaction for the full amount of money. Um, after double checking the address and amount, he presses send to transmit the transaction. Joe's mobile Bitcoin wallet constructs a transaction assigns 0.10 BTC to the address provided by Ellis, sourcing the funds from Joe's wallet and signing the transaction with Joe's private keys. This tells the Bitcoin network that Joe is authorized to transfer a value to Ellis's new address. As the transaction is transmitted via the peer-to-peer -peer protocol, it quickly propagates across the Bitcoin network. In less than a second, most of the well-connected nodes in the network will receive the transaction and see Ellis's address for the first time. Meanwhile, Ellis's wallet is constantly listening to publish transactions on the Bitcoin network, looking for any that match the addresses it contains. A few seconds after Joe's wallet transmits the transaction, Ellis's wallet will indicate that it is receiving the 0.10 BTC. Uh, each Bitcoin can be subdivided into 100 million units, each called a Satoshi, which we'll talk about later. Uh, at confirmations, at first, Alice's wallet will show the transaction from Joe is unconfirmed. This means that the transaction has been propagated to the network, but has not yet been recorded in the Bitcoin transaction ledger, known as the blockchain. To be confirmed, the transaction must be included in a block and added to the blockchain, which happens every 10 minutes on average. In traditional financial terms, this is known as clearing. For more details on propagation, validation, and clearing of Bitcoin transactions, we will cover that later in this book. And so now Ellis is a proud owner of 0.10 BTC that she can spend. In the next chapter, we'll look at her first purchase and examine the underlying transaction and propagation technologies in more detail. So thank you for watching this video on chapter one of Mastering Bitcoin.